Welcome to All About Money on HK IBC. I'm Chloe Fen. After months of learning and shifting views over the usage of generative artificial intelligence, most universities in Hong Kong have reversed a ban and are adopting the technology under certain conditions. But plagiarism concerns prevail, and many academics are revamping their traditional assessment systems to cope with a new and quickly evolving landscape. Is it a blessing or actually a curse for the society and the economy? Let's discuss the implications with Kevin Pereira, visiting scholar at the University of Hong Kong and also the managing director of Blue Artificial Intelligence. So Kevin, it's great to have you back on our show. Yeah, thank you for having me. First thing first, let's talk about the University of Hong Kong's reversal on the usage of generative AI. Uh, we know that earlier in February, the university actually banned students from using this tool, mm -hmm. citing plagiarism concerns. But now they reverse the ban and are embracing this technology for their students. But there are certain limitations. For example, every student, you are only allowed to use 20 prompts mm -hmm. or the increase that you can ask, for example, ChatGPT. Mm -hmm for their academic purposes. Uh, how do you see all of those developments going? And what are your thoughts over the reversal? Do you think the prompts are really needed? Is it justified? Sure. So I think you know the good part about this is they're actually starting from, you know, it, before it was zero, now at least we're, we're moving in the right direction. So I think that's definitely a positive step. I think in terms of you know universities, I think different universities have adopted different approaches to generative AI and how students have to use them. And I think we're very early in this whole journey, right? So because different universities are adopting different uh, um, uh, methods, I think it's going to be interesting to see what those outcomes are going to be. So because generative AI is so new, because the whole education system is still adapting to that, I don't think we can necessarily say what's good and what's bad. I think it's good that different universities are trying different things. And then I think the, the right way to look at this is afterwards, what are the learning outcomes? Right? Did the uh, small, did the limited prompts actually give good educational outcomes? Did they not? I think we right now just don't have enough data to be able to answer those questions. But what I am excited about is that we are going from a situation where they didn't allow them to use it, now ultimately to using them. And I think that's a really important step. Mm, but what about the 20 prompts? I mean, how do we come up with this 20 number? And also, you know, because you can, because the university wants the students to have, you know, better quality, higher quality of questions to, in order to grasp like better answers as well. Yeah. But do you think these limits is really necessary? So I think on the limit side, the, the, the thought process, and I've been looking at a lot of uh, literature on this, the thought process is if they have a limited number of prompts, they'll be more judicious about how to use it. Right? So they'll be thinking, hey, let me make sure that I use the resources in a smart way. And so again, I think we're going to see what the learning outcomes are going to be from that. Right? Maybe students start to really think about ma making more detailed prompts at the beginning so that they might get to their answer a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas there's another school of thought that incremental prompting is also going to be helpful as well. So you get the answer, then you say another prompt, then you say another prompt, then you say another prompt. Again, the tech is so new, so we really don't know what the right um, approach is going to be. So again, I'm happy that different universities are trying different things. And I'm really excited to see what the results are going to be. Everyone is learning on mm -hmm. a learning journey as well yeah. for the lecturers, for the students. But for students, would you say that, for example, those who rely more on the AI tools, for mm -hmm. example, ChatGPT, will be at higher risks of being replaced when they become future uh, workforce? Yeah, so that's a great question, Chloe. We were getting that a lot from many different clients and many different companies out there. My overall view on the full situation is that if you're worried about being replaced, you have a larger chance of being replaced by someone who knows how to use AI rather than by AI itself, right? So the most important thing is being able to understand the tools, being able to have some experience at playing with it, and then having a sense of what tools are good for what types of uses. But I think that's the most sort of you know, important thing that a lot of folks have to think about. I think when it comes specifically to kind of deciding on which tool to use for what, that's a lot of experience. And I think that's something that we're giving younger members of our society a chance to do by learning this in university and also potentially in high school as well. Mm. But under this new context, or mm -hmm. let's say the new landscape, mm -hmm. what should we be valuing more than uh, in order to you know, have a better skill set to cope with a future uh, situation? So if I think about you know, job automation, right? I, I don't really view it as job automation. I view it as task automation. So in your job, certain tasks are easy to automate. Certain other tasks are hard to automate, right? 
So in the future, the way jobs are going to kind of morph is that the AI is probably going to come in and take away the easy to automate part. Okay. So if that's the case, then we need to think about as human beings, how do we complement the AI? Mm. And in my opinion, the or I should say in one category of that is really to think about how are the skills that you have related to human interaction? Because I think human interaction is a hard thing for AI to be able to do effectively. So if you're talking about skill sets, for example, right? I think skills, for example, like trust building, sales skills, I think um, teamwork, uh, creativity, right? All those types of skills are more related to human to human interaction. Empathy. And I think we need to empathy. Yeah, exactly. Right. I think all of those are very much related to the human experience. And even when we look at AI development now, a lot of companies are trying to think about how do I make my AI more human? Mm. So if that's the difficulty there, then I think we as human beings have to get better at those skill sets that are hard to automate and ultimately you know, work on those. The one caveat, though, that I would say here, Chloe, is AI is also evolving as well, right? So the skills that are hard to automate today might actually become easy to automate tomorrow. So I'll, something I'd encourage a lot of your viewers is to constantly think about what are these hard to automate skills today, right? And then focus on the development of AI as well, right? So that they can see how are things going to evolve? Because I think we as human beings will also have to constantly evolve our learning mm -hmm. and get used to a whole sort of culture of continuous learning, which I think is important as well. So those skill sets are going to change. Right. Uh, talking about, for example, for the lecturers, they are also mm -hmm. facing the new challenges because yeah. uh, not only the students, they have to cope with a new situation, but the lecturers may also need to redesign their whole academic assessment systems. Mm -hmm. Because now when, you know, the papers are actually can be conducted by ChatGPT, mm -hmm. then what should they be assessing students about then? Uh, how should we redesign our academic systems to order to have a more uh, a healthier, uh, let's say, system to assess those students as well? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So as the new academic year starts, I'm also rethinking you know, for my courses, you know, how am I going to do assessment? And one of the things I've realized, I think with these new tools, it's about testing the process, or I should say assessing the process, rather than assessing the output. I think it's important to think about it from that perspective. So I've been talking actually to a lot of professors out there. And you mean asking, the whole experience? Uh, I mean more so the process of using these tools, right? So like prompting, for example, things like that. It's more about that being the skill rather than the output because the output's easy now, right? The hard part is the process itself. So your question on assessment, right? I think the way that I've thought about it is that I, I'm thinking that I will give the students, let's say, a task. And I will tell them, uh, I want you to come up with the output, and I'll give you a little bit of a grade for that. But then I also want you to write an essay on why you use that prompt, why you use that tool. You know, why did you actually do it that way, right? And I think that's really going to be testing the process, which I think is important. The other uh, sort of area of assessment that I've also seen that I kind of like is actually taking the output from one of these generative AI tools and asking students to critically evaluate that. Yeah. What is wrong with that? What might be the issue there? And I think that's also going to be another interesting way to do assessment going forward as well. Again, I think we're all learning as professors too, uh, but I think those are two areas that I think are interesting, and I think we'll start to see a lot more of that going forward. Interesting, Kevin. So it's about like breaking down into the input part and mm -hmm. also the output part. So much more details that we can look into on why we use these tools mm -hmm. and how we should evaluate those outcomes as well. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the specific assignments, is there any assi assignments that you would say could be AI-proof? Sure. So I, I guess I come back a little bit to my human to human interaction part, right? So I think the assignments, for example, presentations where they have to get in front of the whole class or get in front of a group of people and actually speak, right? I think that's also something that is hard to, you know, AI, right? I think that's a very human skill. I think things, for example, like teamwork, right? Put them into groups, get them to do an in-class assignment. Mm. I think that also is a very human based skill as well. So I think those two, for me, jump out as very kind of, you know, the right way to teach some of the skills from an assignment perspective. And then I think lastly, um, helping students with a little bit of self-awareness and reflection. Right? I think that is good both in terms of life anyway, but also in terms of using these tools. Right? So I use the tool, I got the answer. Let me think a little bit about was this answer good, was it bad, and how could I improve going forward? Right? So I think building a little bit of self-reflection and making some assignments that do that, I think is also going to be something that is going to be helpful for the students and is something a little bit more on the human side. Hmm.
to have more reflections on those tools as well, on the information. But speaking of that, for example, now, if we can just simply search for certain uh, answers, mm -hmm. the process will be much easier, which is great. Mm -hmm. But then we as humans, we, we, when we go to the universities, we want to develop more of our, for example, the critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And how it develops pretty much relies on how you process those information. For example, you gather the information by yourself yeah. instead of by the machines. Okay. Uh, this, the new development by, with adoption of AI, mm -hmm. in some sense, will actually harm one person's critical thinking capability in some way. And is it a blessing on a curse eventually? Uh, do you think this will also harm the societal innovation in some way when our, for example, intelligence are being more relying on those e artificial intelligence? Yeah, so I, I think there's pros and cons to this. I don't think it's very clear one direction or the other. Um, what I would think about from a blessing perspective, right, is I think on the blessing side, uh, you can imagine that before gathering content was problematic. Right. If you rewind many, many years ago, uh, students actually had to go to the library, right? Or they, even before that, might have an encyclopedia at home. They go look up the stuff in the encyclopedia, and then they write their report. Then we got to, you know, the internet stage, right? People just go and Google this stuff, and then go from there. And then now we're at the part where you can just ask an AI something, and it eventually gives you the, the, uh, the research. That it filtered. That it filtered, yeah. right? So I think here, the even more important skill then actually becomes that sort of critical thinking part to really look at what is the AI giving me, right? And is that right, right? Or is that correct? Or is that actually what I want? And so I think there, the idea eventually is going to be, if there is something you see there that you're not sure about, you should go do some research for it, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's gonna be the skill going forward. It's like the output is easy, but how do I make the output right, right? And that's the critical thinking slash the questioning that I think a lot of students need to get a better handle of in terms of as a skill. Right? And I think that's probably true of students. That's probably true of us as well. Right? As the generative AI kind of comes out with the output, we need to be better at looking at this stuff and then being able to judge, you know, is this right, is this wrong, and how do we look at it going forward as well and how we use it. Basically to question their answers as well. Correct. Like, is yeah. it correct? Yeah. All I right. think we should have been doing this from before too, so it's now even more incumbent that we do. All right, verification. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for your thoughts, Kevin. We'll take a short break, but coming up next, we'll continue our discussions on AI's implications on education and economy. So do stay tuned. Welcome back to All About Money on HKIBC. I'm Chloe Sun. Joining us today is Kevin Pereira, visiting scholar at the University of Hong Kong and also the managing director of Blue Artificial Intelligence. So Kevin, it's great to have you today. Earlier, we have talked about the recent developments in the education sector, but for the overall implications from AI. Many people are referring that the generative AI's usage could lead to the fourth industrial revolution. Do you think this could be the case and or actually we're already at one now? Yeah, I think we're already there. We're definitely on the cusp for sure. I think with generative AI specifically, right, I think the big difference is now we see what we call low code and no code tools. Right? So the idea is that you don't need programming, you don't need coding to be able to use any of this stuff. So you, me, grandma can use it as well, right? And I think that's a really big change because we've never really seen that before. I think before AI was only kind of utilized or used by people that had specialized knowledge. Mm. I think the difference now is everyone can use it. And so I think that's a really fundamental change that we've never seen uh, before. So maybe we're already in this revolution now at present, but if embracing AI is gonna be inevitable uh, one way or another, we're gonna embrace AI or encounter AI's usage into our daily work life, uh, and daily works and also daily lives, at what point do you think would be appropriate for, for example, for the younger generation to access such tools? Because earlier I know that the Education Bureau has asked 450 public sec secondary schools and teachers to incorporate a total of 10 to 14 hours of AI education into their subjects for the Form 1 and Form 3 students mm -hmm. from September to learn about those basic AI concepts. Do you think their assessments are sensible? Is it the right point for children to access AI tools? Yeah, I definitely think so, right? I think the earlier we, we expose them to it, the better it's going to be, right? But I do think at a certain point when they're too young, they might become a little bit over-reliant. And right? I think that's a little bit of a risk. 
So I think form one to form three, it's like, I feel like at that point, they have enough common sense. They've kind of gone through primary school education. And now before they get into university, if they start to use it a little bit, I think we start to build that critical thinking sort of aspect of it. So I, I, I think it's important that they learn about it in the right way, like the, the right way to use it, the responsible way to use it as part of those 10 to 14 hours. Mm -hmm. But I think if we do that, I think it will be a fantastic uh, addition to their skill sets going forward for sure. But also speaking of uh, the AI related risks, this is also a major concern because we're, what we're seeing is like, ChatGPT is not giving the right answer mm -hmm. uh, sometimes. For example, they will just present some answers that they think is correct, but actually are completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Then uh, how do we deal with this? How do we also mitigate such risks, for example, regarding the false information, the misleading information as well? Mm -hmm. So in the industry, we call it a hallucination. Right? Mm -hmm. So this idea that it provides you with an answer, but the answer seems very confident. So it's, you, you feel like you almost feel want very to believe it. Feel yeah. Yeah, right? So I think there, uh, there's a couple of different ways to think about it. I think the human common sense part that we discussed before is, 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 is one way to address that. Uh, secondly, if there's something there that you're not sure about, it's good to reference it and, and look it up, right? To make sure the facts are actually what they present. Because again, these LLMs, we call them large language models, they're very good at putting one word in front of the other and making the total output convincing. Okay? But that is very different to having an answer that's accurate. So it's important to understand the distinction. They're good at providing convincing output. They may not necessarily be providing accurate output. Right? So I think one of the ways we address that is A, through good referencing and also through human common sense as well. I think from the perspective of the people making these models, right, they're also using something called uh, you know, reinforcement learning with human feedback. I think mm. that's actually quite interesting. So there what they're doing is at the end of their process, when they build their large language model, they're getting human beings to rate it. So they're saying this is good and this is bad. So that's another way that developers are trying to mitigate some of these hallucination problems by getting human feedback into those models as well. Mm. Again, can we eliminate? Probably not. But I think we are trying to mitigate those risks. And I think that's a good thing. So human are, uh, humans are teaching those machines mm -hmm to learn about the world and also to be more intelligent as well. Speaking of that, do you think, um, because now some companies are using AI to further develop AI uh, generative artificial intelligence by using AI tools, do you think we can also use AI to detect AI information? Sure, um, I think it's hard, right? Because I think they've tried to build a few of those tools. The challenge with some of that is that the output variety, right, or the difference in output that you get from these generative AI tools is quite wide, mm -hmm. right? And generally when you have AI that's, that's there for that purpose, they're looking for patterns, mm -hmm. right? So if what you're producing is actually very varied, then finding those patterns becomes very difficult. Okay. So in general, as a high level, I think that's difficult. In the future, is it possible? Probably. But as of right now, it is pretty, pretty difficult, mm -hmm. right? So I think then, again, the right way to, to to look at these models and understand what they're trying to do is like we've talked about before, the human mm -hmm. common sense part and really you know, having a critical eye when you look at the output. To sense if there's a shortfall mm -hmm. from the answers as well. Uh, you earlier mentioned about actually the new AI supply chain because there are different kind of jobs being created by AI. Mm -hmm. For example, those people reading the AI answers, yeah. like whether it's good, whether it's bad. So we are forming actually the answers that we intend that we think that is good mm -hmm. in a way, right? Mm -hmm. But actually sometimes when people are arguing that, oh, AI is gonna take our jobs, do you think we are some sort of like overreacting in some way? Because if we review the previous um, industrial revolution, for example, the recent one, the third industrial revolution, we can also call it digital revolution, mm -hmm. when the internet, the rise of internet actually replaced some um, jobs, for example, those calculators because of the computing power, surging computing power. But actually, then we have the e-commerce sector mm -hmm. that actually created thousands more jobs. For example, the, we're talking about the delivery man mm -hmm. and uh, the factories that also, for example, the people distribute, distributing those products. Yeah. In some way, AI will create new jobs as well. Yeah. Should we be that worried about our job replacements by AI? Because ultimately, could those jobs be replaced by AI then be filled with those new jobs? So here's how a framework, right, for some of your viewers to think about this stuff. So I think we're going to see job evolution. So existing jobs are going to change based on what we talked about before or some of the tasks that are easy to automate, AI is going to do, right? So you're going to see those jobs change. Like you said, there's also going to be some new jobs that we've never conceptualized before. I think the way both young people and also older folks uh, get better uh, to be able to do those jobs in the future 
is to build on those skills that are hard to automate. Mm. Because whatever that job is, today we don't know what it is, right? But I think to be able to get that job in the future, I think you need to have those skills that are hard to automate. So my view at the end of the day is, you know, if you build those skills, then whatever that job in the future is going to be, I think that's going to be the right way to look at it. Probably the other caveat, you know, Chloe, that I think is really important here is also time frame, right? So you mentioned the third industrial revolution before. And even if we go back before that, you had the people that were working on the farms, right? Mm. Agricultural sort of, sort of uh, mindset. And then you had the tractor, right? So the tractor comes in. The difference now is that chat GPT generative AI is usable very quickly by everybody. Whereas before the tractor, it still took 30, 50 years to go to every farm, mm. right? So in terms of this job sort of area, I'm actually most concerned about the short term, right? Whereas I think in the medium and long term, I think we'll figure it out. We'll find those new jobs, we'll retrain people, et cetera. But what I'm really worried about is in the short term, we've never experienced this much change in much, such a small time. This, this is right. sort of like shock waves across this whole society. Correct. And that's why I think it's so important that everyone gets into the mindset of using these tools, trying this stuff out, and being a bit more open. Because mm -hmm. I think that will be helpful both for your current job evolution and then also to look at jobs that might come in the future that we don't even know about today. Hmm. Still valuing about those elements at least humanistic approaches or aspects, for example, human interactions, because we still are more prone to interact with humans mm -hmm. instead of machines. We don't know, maybe in the future we like to interact with machines as well. We never know that, so we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. But you are also training, uh, providing some workshops at, the, for example, different businesses as well. In the corporate world, what do they value more? What do, what do they want to learn more about AI from your experience? Yeah, it's a great question. We run a bunch of workshops, many different industries, many different companies, all different sizes. I would say the common theme is a lot of the people that attend the workshops, the first uh, sort of feeling they have is fear. Right? So they walk in, they really don't know what to expect. So I'll show them how to use a tool, we'll play around with it, we'll give them some hands-on experience. And then I think the first step for them is, okay, I've used it. And they actually find it's a lot easier than they expected. Like that's the one common uh, kind of rationalization that many of them have. Oh, it's actually not that difficult, right? I type in something, it comes out, and if I don't like it, I can type in something more and you know, I get a new version, right? Mm. So they get used to kind of what it can do. I think that's the important part. I think the next part for the more senior people is they then start to think about how can I use this in my business to make things more efficient, right? To make things better for everyone. And then I think also there's a bunch of people who think, how can I use this tool in my daily job to make my life easier as well, right? So I think it's just that little bit of hand-holding at the beginning to show them, you know, the, the, the swimming pool is not that cold, like you'll be okay. And then after that, I think once I help them inside, then you start to see them swimming. Mm -hmm. So even for some of the training we've done, like people on the you know, WhatsApp groups or emails afterwards are sharing, oh, I created this picture. Oh, I made this kind of you know, text thing. And it's, really, it's been great to see that. It's like really inspiring. So now they're sharing what they're doing. They're inspiring others to also do that as well. To get involved. It's a very positive sort of uh, virtuous cycle. And I'm really happy about that. And I think that's ideally the training outcome we're looking for. Very quickly before we go, Kevin. So I know there are several different kind of stages in terms of AI development. Now, maybe originally it's going to be artificial intelligence. Now we're talking about generative artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And in the future, we're going to talk about artificial general intelligence. Mm -hmm. In, even in next year, people are saying that artificial intelligence is still at infancy stage. But where are we now in terms of the ultimate goal, for example, the AGI? Sure. So AGI, kind of as a concept, is really about the AI basically being equivalent to human beings, right? I personally think we're still quite far away. But the caveat to that is the growth in AI is exponential rather than linear, right? Meaning that once we start to get really good, it's it starts to get skyrocketing very, very fast, right? So that's why it's hard to have the crystal ball to actually see what's coming there. Um, but I still think we have a little bit of ways to go for, for AGI, but we are seeing components uh, of, of the human sort of abilities being done by AI. And my hope again is that in the long term, we as human beings are a good complement to the AI that we're developing, but that does mean we need to continuously learn and keep on improving. And I think that's the, one of the main messages I would have for your audience tonight. So we're still at the beginning part, mm -hmm. would you say? Yeah, beginning slightly, slightly, slightly more beginning. Beginning to. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for yourselves, Kevin. It's great to have you today. Sure. That's Kevin Pereira, Managing Director of Blue Artificial Intelligence, but also a visiting scholar at the University of Hong Kong. And thank you for watching All About Money. We'll be back next Sunday night. Until the next time, please take care.